can get somebody who does this type of thing. We're going to get these windows replaced um, this month. But this is the time of the year where the sun, when it is out in Buffalo, comes right in there and shines right in the eyes. So if we could, you know, I could probably just do this maybe. But maybe we can get somebody, once we get the windows in, to get some shades put in and, you know, somebody that's good with that type of thing sure would be appreciated. Um, okay, so we're just going to go right to the Gospel of John this morning, get to the 20th chapter. If I keep doing this, you're going to know why. Just you know, lean over this way. We've got a lot of verses to get through this morning. We're going verses 19 through 31. And today's message is going to be mainly doctrinal. There are some verses here that, you know, if they don't get taught, you know, you could run away thinking whatever, you know, all scripture that all scripture needs to be with scripture. You can't just take one verse and arrest it out of its context and say, this is what I believe, if it doesn't line up with the rest of the Bible. And we're going to be talking about that. Um, but there's some verses um, that uh, Roman Catholic doctrine will uh, alter to fit its purposes. And, you know, not that Bible believers is the perfect church and the Roman Catholic church is the imperfect church, but where it errs in doctrine and where we err in doctrine let's let the Bible reprove us and correct us. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Next week it'll be far more applicable and, you know, uh, spiritual. And so you'll, you'll want to come out for that, or you won't, because th it's going to be interesting. That much is for sure. Uh, should we still be here, right? You never know. Could hear a blast of a trump. Could hear a car horn. I don't know. My heart might explode. Who knows what a day may bring forth other than our Creator? So, you know, the time is always of the essence. All right. So, again, lots of verses here. We're looking at verses 19 through 31, closing out the chapter. Uh, let's go ahead and read them and then we'll pray. Get out of this light here. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and say, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Father, help us to see all the truth that these verses uh, have jam-packed in them, Lord God. And I pray for all of our hearts this morning, Lord, that we might want to hear from you and that when we hear, that we might want to be obedient unto you, Lord. Our flesh is so contrary to you and often our spirits even within us are so contrary to you. 
I pray, Lord God, that we would just be humble and willing to let the Word of God be our authority this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Yeah, I've just got, this is, we're going to move. Ready? We're going to try. All right. A little better? Oh, a little better. Here we go. All right. Good? Camera good? Good? I got, should I smile? <laughs> Flash my Joel Osteen pearly whites. All right. Verses 19 through 21. Let's start there. Here we go. We'll read again. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. <laughs> Come on, that'll preach all day long. Will you be glad when you see the Lord? Right? When my faith shall be sight. Yeah. Now, I think this is one of the grand um, underestimates, right? Of, uh, of the Word of God. He does that so often where he'll take something that should just be like, and he just eh, threw in, you know, it's a sentence. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And believe it or not, this is not a I send you message. Usually that's right away where the preacher's going to go. A Bible-believing one, anyhow. You know, you've got to go in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature is what the scripture says. And yeah, so I'm not denying it. That's absolutely there. It's absolutely necessary. But we've got so much to cover doctrinally. That's where we're going to stick this morning. And just like the Lord, he shows up. Anyone that knows the Lord, you know, when he shows up, he shows up with an offer of peace. Right? Peace be unto you. But just like the Lord, he often comes at a time when it'll be difficult to receive it. I'm not saying salvation is difficult to receive. I'm saying he challenges people. Like the lesson in John chapter 6 about eating his flesh. 2,000 years later, people still got it all messed up. Right? And say, why is it difficult to receive this peace right here, right now? Are you reading what I'm reading? You bury someone and have him appear in your living room three days later. Right? Out, out the blue. You're sitting there with your buddies. There he is. Peace be unto you. Right? Yeah, peace. You could jump out of your skin. But that's our Lord. He challenges the norm. Always. That's okay. Because the norm isn't always right. He transcends the intellect and the reasoning of man, and that's okay because the intellect and reasoning of man is flawed. Because it's selfish and inward. He turns the offer of peace into a challenge of faith. And anyone that's walked with him long enough understands this. I have peace every day because I'm saved, and yet every day I face new challenges in that faith that saved me. So peace is here, peace is here, but can you get past your circumstance to lay hold on it? That's the challenge. Verse 22, let's move on. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Tic-tac or not, I have no idea. He breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Well, okay then. Now we've got some doctrinal work to do. The reason I say that is this. Go to Romans 8. We're going to have a few verses. We're going to flip around. Okay, get prepared. We're going to flip around. You would hope that a church that titled itself Bible Believers might actually turn to the Bible. Amen. Romans 8 and verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh... Okay, this is kind of a spiritual standing. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Okay? Now, 
If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, also the Spirit of God, because God is Jesus, Jesus is God, and the Spirit is God, and God is the Spirit, and say, I don't understand, and me either. But if you have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What does that mean? If you do not have the Spirit of the living God indwelling you, the indwelling Holy Ghost, you are not saved. You are not His. You don't belong to God. You say, well, I don't understand. He made me. So? In the flesh, my mother and my father made me. But I have, if I have no interest in knowing them, then I'm not theirs. I'm my own. Same thing. The Lord made you. But you walked the moment you decided to walk. You don't have any interest in him. You're not his. He wants to save you. He wants to adopt you into his family. And that's what is going to be required, according to scripture. Because you're, you're yours and you're the devil's until you become his. See, how does that work? Well, see me after service. But that's, this is what Romans 8, 9 teaches. Okay? Right? We see it, right? Can't deny it. Despite what charismatics teach about the supposed second blessing. You ever heard of the second blessing? Right? Does anyone know what that is? Does anyone not know what the second blessing is? Good. Good. Raise your hand, please. This way, because lots of times I just think everyone knows and then I move on. All right, so I came out of the charismatic movement. All right? So what they teach is that you get saved... And then there's a second blessing to follow, and that's the receiving of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, and I won't go into the details of how they go, because every church is different, every charismatic church is different. But they believe you can be saved and not have the Spirit, but Romans 8 9 says otherwise. So there is no second blessing. You know, that's where they get the, oh, you got baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak with tongues and you do all that stuff. And no, no. The moment I put my trust in Jesus Christ, he indwelled me. And if he didn't, I didn't. Right? Okay, so that's, that's the second blessing. It's less talked about in today, so there's more of an 80s and 90s things. I think they let it go because, you know, a number of those TV charlatans got caught faking their miracles. And so they stopped talking about miracles for a little while. Amen. You know, if it's of the Lord, it, can't be, it won't be found out. And they won't have to charge for it. If you've got to go to a Benny Hinn show and pay $50 to get in and then give a love offering and get your healing, Jesus never did that. If Jesus were walking right now, he'd march himself right into Children's Hospital and he'd lay his hands on every one of those sick children and he'd preach the gospel. He wouldn't just lay hands on the sick and walk away. He'd lay hands on the sick and he'd tell them the truth and then watch all of them walk away from him. Even after healing them. I read it over and over again in the gospel accounts and you know it's true. Because man wants the healing and he wants his belly full and he wants perfect health and wealth and prosperity. What he doesn't want is the truth. All right, now go to Genesis 41. So the second blessing is there is none. <laughs> Every day is a blessing once you're saved. I think it's safe to say you never want to let me know that you're putting any money in the back pocket of a Joel Osteen or a Benny Hinn. Don't waste your money. Verses 37 and 38 of Genesis 41. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom... The Spirit of God is. So now while this is a, this is a heathen king, someone does, does not know Jesus, doesn't know the Lord, doesn't know the Lord at all, doesn't care to know the Lord, but he could recognize in someone 
the Spirit of God indwelling, being Joseph. We get the confirmation from men like King David, who prayed, uphold me with thy free spirit. Spirit's free. There's another anti-Benny Hinn verse. You don't pay for it. You don't pay for it. It's free spirit. Salvation is a free gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to give it to you. Why? Because I love you. Why do I need it? Because you don't love me. I'm, you know, the, the chances are I'm going to offend somebody today. Just go on. Wait until next week. It's going to be good. You want to show up just for that, just so you can get angry at me. You've got to get angry at somebody, get angry at me. I'm okay with that. The Holy Spirit did not arrive when Jesus was baptized. Right, because we read that, and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descends upon him while he's getting baptized in the Jordan. No, he was there from the beginning. Right? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Right? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So he was right there at the beginning. You know who else was there? Jehovah. You know who else? Jesus Christ. According to Scripture, these three are one. They were all there. They were all a part of the what I'll call the recreation. Again, you don't know what I'm talking about, see me after service. So, he, he, the Spirit, and he is a he, he's not an it. He came to men like Joseph, Daniel, Solomon, and the prophets. Before Jesus. Um, well, before Jesus was manifest in the flesh. That said, go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Little lesson on the indwelling spirit. Psalm 51, verse 11. It says, Cast me not away from thy presence. This is David praying. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So, if he prayed that, then he had the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, I've even taught this. But the more I read this, read through the scripture, I, I have to admit, I don't think it's right. I don't think I was right in this. Because we always say, well, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came and rested upon, and then left, and then in the New Testament, he indwells. Yeah, but all the verses that I read in the Old Testament say that, they, that he was in them. So, I was wrong. Bible's right. That's all. I mean, it's that simple. You know, I mean, it's not that big of, a, it's not that egregious of an error, uh, indwelling or ondwelling, but he indwelled them. But here's the difference, though, and this is why David prayed what he prayed. The Spirit could depart. He came and went. You, if you ever get the chance, talk to, to uh, Samson. Spirit decided to leave him the moment he cut off or got his hair cut. Say, why? Well, that's a little lesson on the Nazarite vow. He was not supposed to have the locks cut until a certain, until the vow was met. And that's when they would cut their hair. But so that was, uh, but you know the story. So the apostles, they had uh, gifts of the Spirit uh, resting upon them, within them, however you want to look at it. Because they were cast, if you remember, this is before the Lord breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. He sent them in the Spirit. And they healed sick. They raised the dead. Before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and again, before him breathing on them. Matthew, like all of the Gospels, and the book of Acts, it's an historical book. And, and transitional. Say, what do you mean by transitional? Got your Old Testament and the covenant that, G that the Lord made with his people. 
And you've got the New Testament and the new covenant that he made, which Hebrews says is a better covenant. Okay? So and you say, well, does that mean God is flawed and that the old covenant was not good? You know, but see, the New Testament reveals that if there's a flaw, the flaw is you. It's your flesh. It was weak because of the flesh. So the Lord sent his son to die in the place of sinful flesh. That's, what, that's the whole plan of salvation. It's been mapped out since the Old Testament. Right? But you've got the old and you've got the new. And somewhere in between, they had to kind of line up and transition from the one to the other. That's the whole gospel account. The first coming of Christ is a transition out of the law and into grace. Amen. And so as you're reading through the book of Acts, and you're reading, why did it happen this way, and this way, and this way? And that's why so many people, when they run to get their doctrine from Matthew and Acts, why they make so many errors. Yeah. Because you can't build your doctrine. You're the church. You can't build your doctrine upon something that he was preaching to Israel. So what do I do? Well, I go to the church epistles. Romans through Philemon. <laughs> And everything else, as long as it lines up with Romans to Philemon, I can own and it can be my doctrine. And if it doesn't line up with those things, then it is a doctrine for someone else. That's all. You've got the history of God's dealing with his people from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And it's a stumbling stone for so many people who do not, number one, read the Bible. And for those who do, don't read it carefully study to show themselves approved unto God, or believe it enough to allow it to dictate doctrine. So the Spirit of God will be given in different manners and at different times, even after Pentecost, which you read through the entire book of Acts, until the Jews, the nation of Israel, make the final rejection of him in, in Acts chapter 28. And then it's what you see. Just what you see now is what it is and what it's been for 2,000 years. I believe, I get saved, the Spirit indwells me. Right? That's it. Now, now, right now, in this dispensation, at this moment, the moment of salvation, the Spirit of God enters you and, hallelujah, He will not leave you. Amen. It's the difference between the Old Testament and the New. I can't lose the Spirit. You don't need to pray what David prayed. He's present, if you're saved. If you're saved. You say, well, I need some proof. You know, because people are all always about proof. Right? I need some proof of the Spirit. That's where you get these guys all falling down backwards, barking like dogs, shaking on the floor, speaking in... What are you talking about? Oh, the Spirit. You're just making stuff up, man. You're just speaking gibberish. Cut it up. Knock it off. Oh, I can't. The Spirit has come upon me. Yeah, well, read your Bible, because the Spirit says that the, that the Spirit within the prophet is subject to the prophet. So what does that mean? I am in control. And if ever I'm out of control, it ain't the Spirit of God. That's what the Scripture says. So, now they're either faking it for this, or it's really happening, and it ain't God. It's frightening. It's frightening. So the, and this is the stuff that gets passed off as Christianity. It's no wonder people don't want Christianity. Because if that's Christianity, well, then all they want is my back pocket. I can't trust that. No different than a politician. Men. Yeah. So, well, how do I know? How do I know i got the Spirit of God in me? Well, you see, this, he, he is a he again. And he has some character traits. In fact, there are nine very specific ones that are listed in the book of Galatians. Love being the first. Sir, are you saved? Yeah! <laughs> just want you to love me, sir. No! You gotta preach hard. Okay, all right. Yeah, no, you you gotta preach with conviction. Amen. And you gotta love people. Because that's the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering. You know the fruit, right? There's that. And 
through some other character traits as well. Like a love for a book that you'd have no interest reading otherwise. This book's long, man. Come on. And it gets longer once you crack Leviticus. You know, you're reading, reading along, all right, trucking through Genesis, all these cool stories. You get halfway through Exodus, all of a sudden it begins to become molasses. <laughs> By the time you crack Leviticus, you're like, wow. Right? I mean, that's... Study, study is a weariness to the flesh. Right? So, but all of a sudden, you know, I was reading... Um, I was telling the guys this morning, it's funny because Miles and I were talking out on the street yesterday while we were preaching, and he had talked about how he's in the book of Ezekiel, and I just happened to crack Ezekiel this morning. It's in my reading. So I got through the first seven chapters of Ezekiel this morning, and I'm reading it, and I'm reading it like I've never read it before. It's just so fresh this morning. And I was just, I was loving it, and I don't understand a lick of it. I thought, I mean, every time I think, man, I'm going to understand. I'm going to understand the cherubim now and the wheels within the wheels. I'm going to get it. It's the Lord's just going to right over my head, right over my head. But again, something that I would go, and this is my personality. If I don't understand it, like if it's too heady, I don't want to read it. You know, anyone ever read a legal document? Kill me now. I can't stand the stuff. I don't understand it. And I'm pretty good with comprehension. <laughs> but there's a whole, law is a whole language of its own, and I don't, I've not studied in that language. So, you know, it would bore me. But here I am reading a book again that I don't understand, and yet I'm intrigued. Love this book. The Spirit, he wrote it. That's going to be a part of you. If you're saved, you're going to have a hunger for that. You say, well, I don't. I don't know. I'm sorry. That's not good. That's not a good sign. Desire fellowshipping with God's people. Oh, I've got to go to church again. That's not a good sign. Because he wants to be where his people are. You read it over and over and over again. Or how about the desire to tell someone about the God who saved you? You guys are always talking about Jesus. Yeah, that's because the Spirit of God is indwelling me and I can't not. The only way that someone who's saved um, cannot speak the gospel is if they purpose to grieve the Holy Spirit within them. You have to talk yourself out of what the Spirit is whispering in your ear. And you know what I mean, right? Go talk to that person. No. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed to go talk to that person. Go hand him a track then. Don't talk to him. Go hand him a gospel track. No. <laughs> what are they going to do? Right? And again, so here I am reading through Ezekiel, and he says, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. God is saying, go to those people, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And, and he said a couple of times, and I forget exactly how he said it, but he said, don't worry about how they look at you either. So can I offer you a gospel track? Don't worry. Don't worry about that. Just go, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And we got it way easier than Ezekiel had it. Here, bake some cakes with dung. Seriously. Read it sometime. Come on, you guys got to read the book of Ezekiel sometime. Then I'm going to get all these, can we, can we do a study through the book of Ezekiel? No. <laughs> Verse 23. Verse 23. Though the first seven chapters would be fun. The last nine, not so much. You know what the last nine of chapters of the book of Ezekiel is? The, the design and outlay of the future millennial temple. Cubits and all that stuff. And that shall be 10 cubits by 14 cubits. Verse 23. Mm. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. 
more doctrinal work. We've got us a Roman Catholic snare. From this verse, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Peter, whom they claim to be the first pope who never went to Rome, just saying, he went to Babylon by his own admission in the scripture. That's where he went. He went east. He did not go west. Just saying. That's, <laughs> this is, I kid you not, this is what's so funny. So in order to, because they see that, so the Roman Catholic Church will say, well, yeah, that was us. We were Babylon. So, have you read Revelation 17? And you want to say you're Babylon, the whore of Revelation 17? Okay, then. See, that's how the Lord can just snare you in his word. He can, he, and he does so often. Because you've got to come at it with faith and you've got to believe it. You can't just start taking verses to yourself because you want it to be. So from this, again, this verse, Roman Catholic Church teaches Peter and the rest of the popes after him, and then all the priests have the uh, authority to forgive you of your sins. Hence the confessional, hence the, uh, uh, what are they, what are they, the, uh, the indulgences, vile, wicked stuff. Here, give me money, God will forgive you. That's wicked. I, someone wanted to buy the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Peter looks at him and says, you'll perish with your money. Wicked. You can't buy the things of the Spirit of God. Like you can coax, coax the, the one who created everything. I'll give you ten bucks. Oh, okay. Here's my spirit. <laughs> Use your head. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, when you bring up the confessional booths unto them, which are nowhere in the scripture, and you remind them that According to the scripture, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5, and not a pope or a priest. They ignore 1 Timothy 2.5 and that reference and any other reference like unto it and tell you that this verse here in John gives them the right. Now, may I first say that though it will apply to us, and let me get there, but just because Jesus says something to Peter and the other ten that are with him, Judas no longer with him, doesn't necessarily mean that it applies to anyone else, ever. Right? I mean, if I say to my wife, hey, go get me a drink of water, hopefully I would say it nicer than that, but if I say <laughs> Got to go home with her. Where's she hiding? Oh, there she is. Hey, dear. Um, you know... May I, may I have a drink of water, please, sweetie, dear? If I say that to her, this will be fun. And Joe Meddy goes, sweetie, dear? Oh, well, sure, I'll go get you a cup of water. <laughs> be like, I wasn't addressing you. I'm not talking to you. Stay where you are. Sweetie, dear, not so much. Right? That's right. So, but that's, <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> In order to apply any verse of the Bible to you, you've got to ask a few questions about those verses. Is what was said, does it apply to the church or does it apply to Israel? Who did he say it to? Is it a kingdom of heaven verse or is it a kingdom of God verse? See, I don't know the difference. Well, again, come ask me sometime. We'll talk about it and I can show you the difference in scripture. To which dispensation does it apply? I don't know what a dispensation is. Read your Bible. It's a, it's a Bible word if you've got the King's English. Does applying it to myself cause me to then have to reject other plain verses and destroy the context of the verse of which I am now arresting. Etc., etc. Every verse of the Bible, everyone, Genesis 2, Revelation, without Bell and the Dragon, every verse of the Bible, every verse of the Bible is written for your learning. Romans 15, 4. And I've said this many times, but I'll say it again. 
But not every verse of the Bible is written to you. I can look at a story and go, wow, there's some good stuff there. I can learn some things here. But that doesn't mean it was written to me. Seth, this is for you. For instance, and again, I use this all the time, I was never told to build an ark. I could, but it wasn't a word for me. I was never told to go to Nineveh to preach. Jonah was told that. I was not. So if I start reading the book of Jonah, I go, well, that's just the Lord telling me to go to Nineveh. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you proof right now that it isn't. So what's that? Nineveh doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it's a sand heap. You want to go preach to the sand creatures? Knock yourself out. Well, it does say every creature, right? <laughs> you were never told to go build an ark. It's fine. You were never told to go build an ark. You were never told to go preach in Nineveh. Why don't Christians choose those things to apply to themselves? Except for Ken Ham. <laughs> who built an ark, which is pretty cool from what I hear. But that's a different matter. So, if 1 Timothy tells us that only Jesus can mediate between the Father and man, right here on earth, in the matter of sins, and the Roman Catholic Church tells you otherwise, who do I believe? It should be apparent. For some reason, to a billion or more people, it isn't. It's pretty apparent to me. Strange indeed. Is it not strange? So then, okay, you say, well, you told me a whole bunch of things of what this verse isn't. What is it? What's it all about? This verse is about the authority to declare someone forgiven or unforgiven. It is not about having the power to forgive. Do you see the difference when I say that? I, you, and every other saved person in this room or out of this room has the right and the authority to say to someone who has never trusted Jesus Christ, your sins are still with you. I also have the authority, by the word of God, for someone who said, I have trusted Jesus Christ. He has washed me in, in, in his blood. I've trusted him. I'm saved. I have the authority, by the word of God, to say, you are saved. And they have the authority to say, I am saved. Amen. That's what the scripture teaches. So it never really flies very well. It, you know what, it doesn't fly. Here's the two areas it doesn't fly. It doesn't fly when I say I'm saved. Because how that translates to someone who isn't saved is, oh, you think I'm no good and you're better than me. No. I may be worse than you. I know what's in here. You don't. And I don't know what's in there for you. You, you do. And none of us do perfectly. God does perfectly. Right? So no, no better than you. All I'm telling you is I'm saved by the authority of what Jesus said in the Scripture. He died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He says, if you will believe this gospel, I will give you everlasting life. I believe the gospel. And according to what he just said here, I have the authority to say I'm saved. I'm not better. I'm saved. And if you've never done what I say that I've done, and done as in believe, then you're not saved. And it's not so I can go... Yea, I'm saved, you're not. God forbid. Word of God, everyone was saved. He died for everyone. But it's about your will. Who are you to judge? The one he said could. And I don't need a fish hat. And a white robe or a black suit. And a little white thingy around my neck. I don't need this either, FYI. Amen. So, this verse doesn't just apply to the apostles, it actually does apply to us. Now, here's the irony of it all, to me anyhow. 
Because if you ask a Roman Catholic priest, if I can know that my sins are forgiven and that I'm on my way to heaven, he will reply to the tune of, well, no one can know that for sure, but there's always purgatory. Uh, no, there isn't. Never once have I read, ever, more than 50 times through this book, folks. Never once. Nowhere. It doesn't exist. No purgatory. It is appointed unto, here's what I find. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9.27. Death and immediate judgment. No purgatory to work off your sins. So the priest is wrong there, and he's wrong in the matter of, can I know whether or not I'm saved? And let me show you firsthand, 1 John chapter 5. Say, well, that's all well and good. You're showing me what Rome's got wrong. You're showing me what you think you've got right. You're showing me what the Bible says, but who says that the Bible's right? Amen. It's a, hey, that's a worthwhile question. Say, well, give me that answer that's going to convince everyone. I can't. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. All I can tell you is read it. And it has the power to change your life. There, are, there have been staunch atheists who went out to prove the Bible incorrect. And who studied everything, went through archaeology, went through science, and in the end came away walking out going, Jesus is right, I, I was wrong. I need to trust Jesus. And lots of them, lots of them. Say, what about Stephen Hawking's? What about, you think he's read the Bible? He's just an angry man. 1 John 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you, that ye believe on the name of the Son of God. Everything that's been written, John says, and he did that in, in the Gospel and in his epistles, he says, everything I'm, write, I'm, reading, I'm writing so that you will believe on the name of the Son of God. See the next line? What does it say? Look at it. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. And then he just backs it up by saying, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Not feel like I maybe have eternal life. Not, I, boy, I sure hope so. Not, oh, maybe purgatory will help me out here. No, I know. K-N-O-W. Why? Why? Because I ate a wafer? Because I lit some candles? Because I counted some beads? What does it say? Because I believed on the name of the Son of God. It's right in the text. Now, for a church that claims that it alone has the authority to forgive sins, why would they have a problem declaring someone saved. Isn't that curious? We alone, the Roman Catholic Church, is the only one that can pardon from the sins. So am I saved? No one can know. Then what good are you? Other than to make me feel religious, what good are you? Amen. You say, would you say that to a priest? Give me the opportunity. Come on, some of you know me well enough. Been waiting for the day the Roman Catholic Church invites me somewhere to speak something. Just got to get in. I need an in. Whew. They'd be dragging me out by the end of the message. Now, why put this verse in all of the confusion that surrounds it? Because you've got to admit, if you just look at it at face value, it can be difficult. Right? Sure it can. A lot of verses of the Bible are like that. So why put this verse in there at all if it's just going to cause you confusion? Here's my thought. It's conjecture. It's not scripture. It's just my thoughts. Maybe it's because the Lord knew that there would be a people who would declare sole authority to forgive sins in the name of Christ, no less, without the need for Christ. How about that? 
This verse does not give this authority to the Roman Catholic Church, but to believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ as a whole throughout the last 2,000 years. It's, fu just, it's just so funny to me that the very thing it teaches, the, the authority to declare a man saved, the Roman Catholic Church can't bring itself to do. That ought to speak volumes. All right, verses 24 and 25. To get off of Rome. All right, we're off Rome. 24 and 25. For now, you know. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Note that he said, I will not believe. Believe. Not I cannot believe. I will not believe. Faith is not a matter of ability. According to Scripture, again, if that matters to you, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith to believe. Romans 12 and verse 3. He has put within man, every single one of us, the measure of faith necessary, which is, could just be a grain of a mustard seed. Just enough that whereas when we hear the gospel, we can believe. Now, then there's the spirit within. Not the Holy Spirit, our spirit. Will you believe? Faith is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the will of man. And of course, the lesson here is that even a believer can lack faith from time to time. Yeah, Thomas is not a lost man. He's a skeptical man. For that, I appreciate him. I'm a skeptical man. It's who I am by nature. He is someone I can identify with. Because I've run into a lot of religious hocus-pocus in my day. And a lot of con artists. And I've had a lot of people who come in the name of Jesus who want my money. And including in Bible-believing churches. Why do they got to take an offering ten times in one church, in one service? Are you trying to bleed a stone? I think we'll take another offering. Why? Why don't you preach another verse? Why don't you sing another song? Why don't you pray again? Why do you got to take up another offering? What's the matter with you? For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. why we don't pass a plate here. It makes me cringe. You want to give? There's a box in the back, give. You don't want to give? Don't. I'm not counting on you. I'm counting on him. And I think if we all learn to count on him, we'll just naturally give. It's just who we will be. It's just who we'll be. I have to preach it, force it down your throat. So I get skepticism, but here's the problem with skepticism. This prob I, this, I will admit, this is a problem that I have because I'm a skeptic. Skepticism protects people, right? It protects us from those who would do us harm so that we're not easily duped, right? Because there's a lot of con artists out there. But the, on the flip side of that, skepticism just may be the reason you miss out on something that the Lord is trying to do with you. We're trying to say to you. And maybe there's times that I personally have missed out on something the Lord wanted me to do or wanted to say to me because it's just hard to believe that. I will not. I will not. So just speaking for myself, Maybe someone else, it applies to you too. Verse 26. See, when I'm preparing messages, there are verses that just preach to me. You know what I mean? And so when I deliver it to you, I'm preaching it from the perspective of how the Holy Ghost kind of went, yeah, this is you. So what am I going to say to you? Am I going to condemn you for being a skeptic? No, because then I'd be a hypocrite. So I just say, I understand, but man, we need to get past that because maybe the Lord wants to say something to us. 
Verse 26, And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, uh, came Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now, we've discussed this already. I think it was last week. I said that we will uh, talk about the resurrection body when we get to our first Corinthian study. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. But man, oh man, this is, this is interesting stuff. He just he appears through walls at the speed of thought. And according to Scripture, I'll have that ability one day. Say, man, oh man, the fairy tales you believe. The fairy tales you believe. I don't know, monkey to man. Sure, because we've got a lot of proof of that around here. Show me one, please. Come on, you're always asking me to prove my faith. Prove yours. Well, the fossil record. What fossil record? Show me the fossil record. Don't give me a drawing that somebody wrote for the cover of Time Life magazine. Because it should get simpler as you dig down then, correct? And yet every archaeological evidence shows, shows uh, civilizations with great technology. I see fish, fish fossils found in the Himalayan mountains. How did that happen? Oh, but then again, I do read about a flood that covered the highest mountain to 15 cubits over it. You gotta admit, finding a fish fossil on a mountain is a little weird. And yet, there it is, over and over and over again. And you show me one monkey to man. Show me one, please, one, one, and prove it, and I'll close the book up. You can't. Say, so, well, you can't prove yours either. No, but you see, God doesn't want, how do I want to say this? He wants your faith. You're telling me science would dictate I don't need faith, it's just science. But you've got no evidence, so it's not really science. You're just asking me to believe something that apparently happened two billion years ago that you weren't there to see. Amen. So it's a faith. So is mine. Now I'll gladly show you where I get mine. And you can reject it in the same way that I'm going to reject Time Life magazine. It's all up to you. It's your choice. This is my choice. We'll see who's right. He's right. All right, where are we? Verses 27 through 29. You want to go home. I want to get you home. Here we go. A couple more, a couple, few more verses. And then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Amen. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. So eight days ago, the Lord shows up, right? Thomas wasn't present. Upon the hearing of the Lord's arrival, he declares that without seeing, I will not believe. It's a declaration of faithlessness and doubt and skepticism, and again, one I can understand. Eight days later, the Lord makes a beeline for Thomas. Right? Just shows up. Woo, there he is again. <laughs> right? He's got closed doors. I mean, they're hiding because of the Jews want to kill them. So they're hiding in there in their bunkers, stash of beans and rice that they bought for a thousand dollars from somebody on TV, stashed in the corner, hiding. All of a sudden he shows up. Peace be unto me again. It's like, you gotta stop doing that, man. <laughs> You're gonna give me a heart attack, right? And then just stops and goes right to Thomas. And 
So that preaches to me, because I think he, he'd go right, you know, if I was, same situation, I'm that skeptic. I just know it. I know I'm that skeptic. And he goes right to me. And he says, look it, fine, you need this? You need this? If that's what you need, fine, but be not, be not faithless. Believe. So he offers him proof. We read, the, we read the witness account, the eyewitness account of men who, the, who saw it. Eleven men, other disciples, 500 people at one time. They all wrote about it, different authors at different times. So you can reject that eyewitness and receive the testimony of Bill Nye, the science guy, if you want. Is that his name? All right. The, falsely so, the science falsely so-called guy. Now, he could have beat Thomas down. I've heard for years preachers beat Thomas down. I don't beat him down because, well, he's me. I'd be a hypocrite. But he did come away with the moniker for 2,000 years, Doubting Thomas. Poor soul. If anyone here thinks they might have done better, maybe we ought to talk. I don't think we would have. Again, maybe it's because I'm a skeptic. Thomas had his moment of doubt, which, come on, man, we all experience it. But he finished well. He has a declaration of faithlessness and doubt, and eight days later, he has a great declaration of faith and doctrinal truth. My Lord, you are my master, you are my, the risen Christ, but you are also my God. By the way, Jesus did not rebuke him for referring to him as God. The angels, over and over again, you read when someone bows down before them in Scripture, they say, get up, I'm a man. Just like, I'm just like you. Get up. Jesus never once denied worship, which, I, which makes him one of three things. A liar, a lunatic, or he's the Lord. Right? He's either a con artist, he is a crazy man, or he is who he said he was. You say, well, how do I know? You gotta, you gotta choose. You gotta choose. And the Lord didn't beat Thomas down. He simply presented himself and asked Thomas to be of more faith than he had been. That's it. Thomas required sight, but a greater blessing rests upon those of us who will believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again three days and three nights later. Right here, right now, there's a greater blessing upon us. Thomas was blessed. There's a greater blessing upon us because I've never seen Jesus. And if you haven't, why not? Not as in I saw him, but as in I see it. I get it. I understand now. Will you believe? Not can you believe. Will you? You can. You won't. Or you will. Verses 30 and 31 say, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Oh, there's so much more. There's so much more to the story. I can't wait to hear it. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. There is the declared purpose of the Gospel of John according to the Holy Ghost. He wants you to believe. Why? So that you can have everlasting life. That's it. That's all I got to do. I got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, died for my sins, buried, rose again three days, three nights later, and he did it for me in love. Yes. There's got to be more. Why? Well, I got to do something. Yeah, you got to believe. Amen. Religion wants you to do things. God wants you to believe if the word means something to you. That's the word. All right, we got one more chapter to go, guys, and then after, it'll be a hundred, Lord willing, it'll be a hundred lessons out of the Gospel of John. So almost two years into this book. Father, thank you so much for your word.
Uh, I pray, Lord God, that, um, that those of us who were reading and listening and contemplating, Lord, that um, maybe you spoke to us, Lord. And, and if you spoke to us, that maybe we would respond to it. Um, maybe there's doubt and skepticism, Lord. Uh, the best of the best in the scripture, uh, people doubted and were skeptics. Lord, I, I'm thankful that even myself is, is a, a, an oft skeptic, that Lord, that you still work with me. And um, you give me some things from time to time out of the scripture that make me understand that there's no way that a man could have written this book. And uh, Lord, your word is now all I ever need to trust. And so I thank you for the book. I thank you for the lessons therein. I pray that we'd all get to a place, Lord God, where we can just read the book and even if we don't understand it, say, well, this has got to be true because it's just so trustworthy. And Lord, thank you for sending your son for me, someone who does not deserve to be saved by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you for loving me enough, my brothers and sisters here enough, to send your only begotten son to die in our place for our sins that we might have everlasting life. All praise and glory and honor and majesty belong unto you both now and forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.